Weed Snackers, Scott here from Weed Snacks, and we have a very, very special guest today. We have Emmy Award-winning writer, producer, director, Tom Sanchez, I mean Tom Schnauz, <laughs> dear old friend of mine, one of the most talented men working in Hollywood. He's the creator, well, he worked on The X-Files as a writer, and he's also one of the co-creators of Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul. It's a pleasure to have him here with us today. Tom, how are you, my friend? I'm doing good. <laughs> so good. Ken. Very cool. Well, I'm so excited to talk to you, Tom. I just a couple, uh, you know, just quick things. Um, let's start off with like, let's just talk about um, Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul. Tell me something right away. I'm really interested in this story. Now, I heard this is coming secondhand. So I wanted to hear from you for all your fans here in Albuquerque. How did the show start? There's this rumor I heard from a mutual friend that the original idea for Breaking Bad started with you. You had this idea and then you gave it to Vince and then he said, can I write a pilot with that? That's not what happened. Okay, so clear up the lies, please. <laughs> <laughs> Vince and I, this is post X-Files. Neither one of us was, were, were working. We were just talking on the phone. It's like an hour long conversation that went everywhere. And I brought up a New York Times article I had read about this guy who was cooking meth in a, in a building and had gotten the kids in the apartment above him sick from the fumes. And like that, that freaking asshole, that you know, dirt bag, you know, cooking meth in a, in a building. And, you know, two old men is complaining about, uh, you know, somebody else. And eventually, somehow, the conversation got back around to, we're out of work, we need to make some money. Hey, why don't we start cooking meth in a, uh, like a Mr. Softy van driving around, uh, doling out meth to people in a, you know, a mobile, uh, you know, ice cream truck. Uh, just, as a just as a joke, just gallows humor about how we can make some extra cash. A week later, we, we ended our conversation. A week later, Vince then called back saying, remember that thing we were talking about, about the meth that I had? I was like, what? I don't know what you're talking about. He's like, Mr. Softy thing? What? <laughs> yeah. I was like, mind if I run with that? I was like, I, you know, whatever. I don't even remember. I don't know what you're talking about. What idea you're going to come up with about that conversation? So it was really just a, I was involved in a conversation with Vince that sparked an idea with him that he came up with this thing about a, a man in his going through a midlife crisis needing to cook, cook meth to leave money for his family. So that was that was my involvement in a very indirect way in, in Vince getting off on this story idea. And he then went off and about a year later, he had a script uh, that I read. I was like, wow, this is amazing, <laughs> amazing. So I really had nothing to, I mean, very little to do with him coming up with the idea for Breaking Bad. Tom, you're not doing the Hollywood thing. You got to say it was all my idea. And <laughs> it was stolen idea. from me. It was all me. <laughs> fucker. It's Gilligan. He owes me. I want that Never like that Vince guy. No. <laughs> That's Dad, great, though. <laughs> I have a question. This came from one of the staff here at Weed Snacks. They, were at, they wanted to know, why was Rio, Ran Rio Rancho High chosen as the high school? Was it just random or was there a specific reason why you chose that high school here in Albuquerque? I don't know. I wasn't there in season one. I only joined right. Bad in season three because I was on a show called, I actually got the offer for Breaking Bad and a show called Reaper at the same time. Well, Reaper was, I was going to talk to you about that. One of the great underrated shows, but go on, go on. I want to interrupt. <laughs> so I, two offers at once never happens in a writer's career and uh at the time reaper was picked up and going breaking bad was not i called vince said i want to work with you what should i do he, and he didn't think breaking bad was going to get picked up so i took the reaper job a week later breaking bad was picked up i had already accepted the offer glad i did i met a lot of great people at reaper a lot of great actors ray wise etc uh tyler labine um so glad i took that job would have been cool to be beyond Breaking Bad from the beginning, but I got to join in season three anyway after Reaper was canceled. Yeah, well, that's when it got really good. <laughs> no, so <laughs> when you joined. No, one thing, I, I do want to give a plug to Reaper. If people are not familiar with Reaper, it's a great show, and I truly enjoyed it. It's one of the better supernatural, I mean, supernatural comedies. It was very edgy and funny and original. It was a great show. So if you get a chance, if you go to Hulu or another place where you can find it, check out Reaper. It's a great show. It, it died too soon because it was fantastic. 
<laughs> Michelle, Michelle Fazekas and Tara Butters created the show, and uh, they're good friends of mine. I love them. And uh, yeah, it was a fun show to work on. It was definitely a great supernatural comedy, which you don't see, see a lot of. And again, Ray Wise, and Twin Peaks fans in, in out yes. there. Uh, Ray Wise plays the devil. He's awesome. Yeah, he's one of the best devils around. Uh, he's that's how I imagine the devil being, just like him. If my, if the devil was my father, <laughs> that was a great show. Well, getting back to Breaking Bad, we we had a we had another uh you know from the peanut gallery here at, at Weez Next question. They wanted to know about the fly episode. Uh, they wanted to know if you personally found that episode just a a filler waste of time or was it exactly what you guys wanted because i mean i like that episode a lot but it does end up on a lot of lists and you know for you know most annoying or you know what's your thoughts on that episode i that personally one, enjoyed it that, way. <laughs> that was one of the first ones my my dad called me up he would call me up after episodes and, and he was like yeah i don't know about that episode <laughs> <laughs> but no, it wasn't no i don't, never considered any episode we did to be filler uh, it was certainly thought of as a bottle episode because we were way over budget on a lot of other episodes. So we thought, let's do an episode that we can primarily film on stage in our laboratory set. Um, so it was that's where the idea sort of came from of what would go on. Why would we spend a whole day uh, or whole episode on the one set? And it was about Walt uh, sort of losing his grip with reality a little bit. Um, and no, I didn't consider it a filler episode. I, I end up liking it very much. Um, so I think it's, yeah, I think it's, I think I agree with people who put it on their top 10 list. Oh, good. I do too. You know, because I had a fly that was bugging the crap out of me yesterday. And I literally was thinking of of that episode. And then I came in today and, when, and Logan, who works here, was like, can you ask him about the fly episode? I said, yes, yes, I will ask that question because I, I, I'm just like, I'm just like, you know, Walter White, I get very annoyed by flies and get obsessed with them as well. So <laughs> I appreciate it. So I have a question. This is, this is a, a question for you. When you guys are doing the show, and you're trying to plan out the season. Now, a lot of people aren't aware of this. A lot of people think that every single element of Better Call Saul or Breaking Bad was planned out ahead of time. When you started a season, you had it all figured out. Not quite true, right? Could you explain that to, the, to our viewers? What, what actually happened? Was it, not everything was planned. Sometimes you planted something and then came up over the season how to pay it off. Could you talk about that a little bit, Tom? That's right. I mean, we would meet at the beginning of a season as a group of writers and talk about big ideas. What could happen? Where, where could we go? We put like uh, Gus blowing up, uh, H Hector blowing up Gus Fring was an idea that was actually kind of talked about in season three before we used it at the end of season four. And so it was just, we write these ideas on cards and put them up on the, on the cork boards. And a lot of ideas never, we never did, you know, just we come up with big things and put it up. And if it's used, great. We'll take it down and put it, you'll plug it in here. It's a great, oh, we could do, you know, as we're building, oh, we had this great idea. That would fit great here. This is like puzzle pieces. We're putting puzzle pieces together so they fit in a logical way. So we come up with these big ideas and just put them on a board. Then we go back to the beginning and start episode one of whatever season we're in and start at the very beginning and do a method that we call brick by brick, which is we take these index cards, which I have a bunch of, a bunch of and we'd write each scene or, or story beats on these index cards and we put them up one after another, starting in the teaser. Okay, what's the first image? What's the first thing that happened? What's a great, what's a great starting point? We'd write it down, put it up on the cork board and just work from there without knowing, even knowing what's gonna happen in the next episode. We didn't, we, we weren't like building it like, oh, we need to reach this point or that point. We're just like, okay, where's the character's head at? Whereas we usually start in, Breaking Bad with Walter White because he's our main character. What's his head at? Where's what's he thinking about of what happened last season? What's he thinking about? What's his next move? So we'd start building there. All right. Well, what's Jesse Pinkman's? Where's his head at? How does his next move line up or interfere with Walter White? We'd build from there. And where's Mike? And where's Gus? And we do all these things and we start flowcharting each person's mindset of how they interact. And that starts building the story of where. It's going so we were letting the characters take us on a journey instead of saying, "Oh, Walt needs to shoot 
Mike or whatever, you know, Walt needs to kill Gus. We need to get there and do that. How do we get there? We didn't say that. We just went along. And if it got to a mindset of that, well, that thing works here, we'll do that. And sometimes we get to a point and get stuck and go, we'll backtrack and say, oh, this is really cool. Well, if we adjust this back here in the beginning of uh, in uh, the act one, we can make this change, do this flow chart change. That'll help us get to this really cool ending. So it, it kind of, we never thought we need, you know, we never built towards, but we need to get to this certain ending. Uh, we let the characters take us. That, that's a that's a really a seminal point, Tom, and, and I think so many writers need to hear that. I think so much what you see in TVs and movies today feels so contrived, like they're they're trying to get to this point, and you can tell, and they're making every they're making the tail wag the dog to get to this moment, as opposed to letting the story organically flow. It's logical for the character, and yeah. I, and I, I yeah. love and I think that's what made the show so great. You really felt the truth of the characters the whole time. You never felt like this is. Why is he doing that? That makes absolutely zero sense because you wanted to have this big fight, you know? Yeah. So no, I think that was a brilliant way to approach the show, Tom. That's great. Yeah, that's, I mean, that all started with Vince, you know, Vince is... Okay, okay. We're getting a, a question asking, from the peanut somebody, gallery. Somebody's yes. asking what's up with the pizza? Why did they throw the pizza on oh, the roof? Why did, this is the number one by way. I get asked this all the time. Why did they throw the pizza on the roof? I'm surprised you're not, your number one question was, why wasn't the pizza sliced? I don't know if you look at that episode. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Which was not written into the script. It was just a production. I don't know what, I think they thought. I didn't want to get the prop person in trouble. So I wasn't going to say anything, although it's bothered me for years. We paid it off later <laughs> in another episode where Jesse's having these wild parties. They order a pizza from the place and they're like, it's not, not cut. And, and Badger or somebody says, well, that's the gimmick. They pass the savings on to you by not cutting, by <laughs> taking away the labor of cutting the pizza, they save however many cents and they pass the savings <laughs> on to you. Um, why Why did he throw the pizza on the roof? He just got frustrated with Skyler. He was trying to get, ingratiate himself back into the family and Skyler was like, not having any of this. He, he just, as he walked out, he just flung the pizza and Brian Cranston did it on the first take which was pretty amazing. <laughs> they, they, like, like I think the director wanted to practice, and Brian was like, "No, let me, let me just try this." And sure enough, he flinged it, and it landed on the roof, and it was great. <laughs> oh man, and Cranston missed his, you know, his calling as a pizza flinger. Um, <laughs> I heard this other story about production, though, and is it? And correct me if I'm wrong about this. The famous episode where they're stuck in the RV and it has no power, and they think they're going to die in the desert. Now, the story, the inside scoop, as I heard it was that the network was not giving you guys enough money for the show at that point because it still hadn't blown up quite as big. And so you were on a limited production. So on the limited production, you were stuck in the RV and that's why you made, and it turned into a brilliant episode. Is that that's true? What, was it a budgetary reason that got you stuck in that RV? That's a, and again, this is a season two before I joined, uh, Sam okay. Catlin wrote this episode, uh, but I do know about it from talking to, to the guys and being in the room that it was developed as as another bottle episode to save money. Right. Um, but it became one of the most expensive <laughs> episodes I think they ever had ever Why? done. How did it become so expensive? It, I think it was very elaborate. I think it was, if you watch that episode, it's more elaborate than it seems. And a lot of driving right. out, uh, even though they shot it like right behind the stages, it was a Michelle McLaren directed episode and she directed the hell out of it. That's why so it makes it, Sam's writing and Michelle's directing make it one of the great episodes. Um, yeah, I think it just, I don't know, I, maybe I'm, I'm probably wrong in saying it was one of the most expensive, but it wasn't, it didn't save money. <laughs> <laughs> right, <laughs> backfired. But it all worked out great, because you made that network so much money, I, I'm sure they're not complaining. So I, <laughs> you know, not at all. <laughs> so I have a question. How much was theme discussed when you were developing, and both shows, with, with Saul and also with Breaking Bad? Did you guys ask, because to me, I mean, again, I'm probably just talking out, off my butt cheeks, but to me, the show is always talking about, you know, it really gets into the theme of the slippery slope of evil. How the Cranston starts off, Walter White, Heisenberg starts off, and, and Saul, Jimmy, starts off the same way. You sympathize with them. There's really good concrete reasons why they do the first bad things they do, mm -hmm. but then it's, it becomes a cascade of bad decisions and i'm wondering just if you could maybe just talk a bit about the themes of the show and how much you guys thought consciously about we're trying to send a message here about 
evil and corruption. Could you speak to that a little bit, Tom? Yeah, I don't, I think to Vince's credit, we never ever thought about themes or messages or like what message do we want to tell society? It was like, we're just going to tell our story and whatever people take away from it, great. Uh, on the other hand, I mean, Vince came up with a great, very great idea of we're going to turn Mr. Chips into Scarface. So in in that, right. you know, that pitch, you're you're talking about what can make a good man corrupt. So yeah, I mean, there's themes. I mean, with with Jimmy McGill, we talked about addiction, about him being addicted, and also Kim Wexler, in turn, being addicted to the con, to, to the life of right. conning. So we always thought of of it as an addiction story. But we weren't ever trying to preach any particular angle about don't hey you out there don't do this or that, um, or we're, we're you know we're planting our flag and 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 saying this about society. There was none of that. We never talked about oh we need to send a message to the world. It was just like we're going to tell the stories of these particular characters, and whatever larger theme people get out of it, great. We weren't you know and. Anybody that watches the show and says there's a theme, uh, you know, it's not for us to argue that they're wrong or right. It's, you know, people will watch it and take what they can from it. And hopefully they there's some life lesson or whatever they they learn. But, you know, on a on one level, yeah, we talked about for the characters, addiction or um, corruption or, you know, turning turning evil. But we never thought we this is we're trying to tell society x y or z that's that it's very interesting and I, I like that you left it open for the audience interpretation <laughs> i watched a whole video the other day by the way basically saying the message of gus Fering and, and your secret message was that fast food is meth and it's the same thing and i was i remember i was just laughing i'm like i really doubt that tom <laughs> went through that with vince <laughs> okay, we got more questions. oh more questions more, more audience questions, questions. Bring them on, motherfuckers <laughs> What do you got? What's up with the this? So this is a person who knows about filming. Jesse's filming locations were all very close together. The apartment, the house, and the parents' house. Was this an intentional thing that was done? Also, there was a common ideal idolization of Walter White. What do you think about that? That people have idolized Walter White and made him such a common character. Did you get all that, Tom? I did. Yeah. The the. <laughs> The filming locations were not intent. I mean, we just liked a location and filmed at it. It was just happenstance that one would be near another. Like uh, Chuck McGill's house actually was like right around the corner from uh, where Jesse's house was. And it was just uh, people were open to letting us film at the houses and we liked the houses. And we had actually in Saul had to sort of bend over backwards sometimes to not get a glimpse of Jesse's <laughs> house. Oh, we my God. They get like, oh, they're separate neighborhoods. They're not close to each other. Um, so, yeah, just filming locations were not uh, ever meant to be near each other for any reason other than those were the things that were available available to us to film in. And our locations managers maybe had a line on, on you know, we're, we're well known in the neighborhood and had a line on particular homes in a certain area. So that's why we tended to gravitate towards certain area of Albuquerque as opposed to another. It was all, you know, just location dependent, not on purpose. And people who idolize Walter White, I mean, uh, you know, we were, we were told the story of a tragic, flawed character. Um, yeah, we tried to make him look cool in certain instances where he's facing up against Tuco or, um, you know, whatever situation uh, he was being clever in. But ultimately, he was a, you know, he's a bad guy. <laughs> In the end, he does a lot of despicable things. And a lot of people get hurt because of his actions. So, you know, it's but people idolize Scarface or whoever. I mean, it's just, right. it's, you know, it's just, it's a, it's a fictional character. So it's, you know, you could idolize, as long as you're idolizing a fictional bad guy, you know, so what? I don't care. You could, uh, let, you could love Dr. Doom or, <laughs> or whoever, I, you know, whatever bad right. guys you love. That's that's fine. If you want to idolize Walter White, that's OK with me. Well, the thing is, Tom, you guys wrote him so well. And, and sometimes I think this is true of all literature, not just a Breaking Bad. 
and Better Call Saul, the villain is often more compelling and interesting than the hero because they're complex and flawed in a way I think as we as humans can identify with, with our own flaws. And I think that's what made, you know, Walter White so interesting. He's so flawed and we see ourselves in him in weird ways, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And I think, and you know, people, when we were writing the episodes, we thought, oh, Skyler, Skyler White, his wife is right about so many things. And she's correct. I mean, she's she was a good person, but people started hating the character because she got in our hero's way, even though he was doing right. <laughs> things. It was they they were like, "Don't get in Walt's way." He's doing, he's you know he's trying to help the family when he really in the end it wasn't trying to help the family. So people, it was just it was just an interesting thing to to see unfold as they started getting word about how many people like just despise Skyler like. Wow, it's like she she was a force of you know, of quote unquote good in the show, trying to and reason, do, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Did you with did you ever have moments when you guys were writing the characters where you're like, we just made we just made him just you know too, too despicable, too unlikable, too much of a Philly fan, you know, and we just can't go. <laughs> It's an inside joke because uh, Tom hates Philly. But, uh, you, you know, a, have we taken it too far? Or or did you just look at it at some point? He's Teflon. I mean, he could poison a kid and people will still want to see the show. <laughs> no, we it came up a lot. It was like, are we are we going too far too fast? Is he too bad? And we'd like, well, if people don't like him, then, you know, that's the story we're telling. And then they'd, they'd still love him. I'm like, this what? I, it was a fascinating experiment. It was because, uh, again, and that's, a lot of credit to Brian Cranston. He just has, a, you know, an appeal that it was say with Aaron Paul. It's like these guys can can do these things, and you still they're lovable in a way, and uh, so you root for them. So it was a, a lot of credit to the actors, um, and also to to Vince in the beginning. You know, once you have this guy with cancer dying, and he has this idea that I want to leave money for my family so they're taken care of you're on board it's like you're rooting for them so you still have that initial uh seed planted where even when they start doing the terrible things and even like because in another brilliant thing that was done before i got to the show was that their friends gretchen and elliot offer to pay for all of walt's medical expenses remember it and, well yes <laughs> so he says no i'm gonna cook meth <laughs> which is right there you would think the audience would be like what the hell is he doing but no they they under for whatever reason they started understanding that this guy was finally experiencing life for the first time he was out of his you know boredom and doldrums and just not living he was finally brave and and facing up to to tuco salamanca and you know you know standing up and being a man and being you know so it was this weird thing and you 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 got it you went along for the ride and it was it was great how much input did the actors you know um have on the like cranston you know uh, you know and aaron paul how much input did they have on the writing process would they come to you as a writing staff and say i don't see the character doing this or could you try this or did they were completely out of it just doing their thing and getting the scripts yeah pretty much uh my memory it's so long ago that my memory is hazy uh, but I, I i i know brian and aaron maybe visited the right while we were breaking visit the room once uh, uh -huh. and that, that was it and everyone so you know a script would come out and they'd they'd uh brian would maybe have an issue of like oh, i wouldn't say this or that or whatever we talk about it um but there was no input of like i think my character should do this or that uh, during the breaking process, they they never said they never influenced us in that way. And uh, since it's more recent, I could talk about Bob Odenkirk. He wanted to read the scripts when they came out and not be surprised and not know what was going to happen. And I think that was the same for Brian and Aaron and the rest of the cast. They just wanted to be surprised and not know where the character was going, uh, so that they could live in the moment. Um, so yeah, they didn't really. They didn't really. I was, ask, was there ahead. was there improv on the set, or did you guys stick basically to what was written? It was all written. There was no very very little improv. Uh, I could the one moment of improv I can talk about because it was basically 
scripted that Bob improvs is that I had a scene in season five of Better Call Saul where he's filming uh, these commercials. Yes, and I remember. There's all these actors, and it was just like, just let Bob go and do whatever let he Bob wanted. be Bob. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, let Bob. Let Bob do his thing and just get in there and do funny stuff with the actors. And we just filmed a lot of it and cut it into a montage, and it was it was great. So that was the only that was the only real improv moment that I recall. Um, and again, it was it was scripted as this because uh, there was nothing as a writer that I was going to come up with it was that Bob on the set with these different characters actors were going to he was going to do great things. So we just like just let him go. And it was one of the most fun days on set, just sitting behind the monitor with the headphones on, just watching him. Uh, <laughs> just just. <laughs> But see, so funny. Oh, that's great. Okay, I'm going to put you on the spot here. My favorite episode, of course, would be the one you directed where the two twins go at Dean Norris in the car. That was a brilliant episode. I really enjoyed it. And my favorite moment. That was the first one I wrote. I didn't direct it. That's Michelle McLaren. Oh, you wrote it. Okay. Still my favorite. It was brilliant. A great, great episode. My favorite moment of Breaking Bad was uh, well i mean it's the most heartbreaking moment is when walter white watched watched her die just let, sat there watching her od it's so heartbreaking but it's one of the most brilliant tv moments i've ever seen it was so raw and emotional i almost cried myself what are your favorite moments in your favorite episode and you can name your own we'll think nonetheless of you <laughs> um boy that's a tough one i just talking because we're talking about the episode four days out in the rv in the desert and knowing the story about this again, it was in a season before I got there. Um, Walt comes up with an idea uh, to save them, and he says, "Jesse, you said it yourself." And he says, "A robot? We're going to build it." You know, they were talking about building. <laughs> thinks that's the solution, and that was not scripted. Uh, that was uh, a, an assistant. One of our assistant cameramen came up with that line after we they had wrapped. Oh, and it was wow. so funny and good that they were like, Let, we got to go back. We got to go back. And they went back and they filmed uh, them saying that exchange, which is, it's so, it's so funny. It's one of, that's one of my favorite moments for sure. Oh, that's great. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, it's, well, I don't, I don't even know what to, what to choose. There's a, <laughs> there's a lot of good fun stuff. I know. I'm sorry for putting you on the spot. So I, I won't push you too far on that level. What was it like? I, you know, I just recently watched rewatched the episode that you directed of um, Better Call Saul, where they came back. What was it like to see them again? Was it just like good old times? And yeah, that, I mean, that as far as talk about favorite moments, that was great. I can't even just because it was done under such secrecy, and it was just you know the planning of because these guys are busy in their own right. They were doing separate things, and just we had a a moment in time where they could come fly out to Albuquerque secretly together. <laughs> and we had them for three days um, or actually two days each. They had an overlap on the one day because Brian shot a scene for episode, uh, uh, the final episode and Aaron shot a uh, scene for the penultimate episode and they had the overlap for my episode. I had them for a day and a half shooting in the old in the RV, which they reconstructed and had to get all this stuff to try to match the old RV from however many years ago. It worked. It's I was like, yeah, look at it. And then you did the you did like the shot of the bullet holes on the door too. Perfect. I'm sure there's people out there measuring them to make sure that it's the exact <laughs> bullet hole. Got it. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly right. Yeah. I think they had the basic frame of the of the RV, but they, they had a uh, reconstruct a lot of the interior. And it's so funny when you're standing on the set, it's so much bigger than the real RV. <laughs> and sometimes you notice that on, on camera, like this is way bigger than an RV should be. <laughs> but this uh, switching gears just um, a, a little bit um, from the show. Is the Breaking Bad, well, not switching gears that much, is the Breaking Bad universe over after El Camino and after Better Call Saul? Is it done? Or is there going to, there was actually, I got a text this morning from a mutual friend of ours asking if there's going to be a spinoff of the intern Carrie Anderson character. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just wondering, are there any plans to do any more with the Breaking Bad universe? Uh, I have not heard anything. I don't, but never say never, uh, right. you know. 
It's uh, it could be up if uh, Peter Gould gets an itch to do the Kim Wexler Chronicles, and who knows? Uh, yeah. But there are no plans. I don't think Vince Vince is busy with his or was before the strike was busy with his new show. And Peter, I know, was not doing anything Breaking Bad or Saul related. So I don't think there will be. But you know, who knows? You know, I I don't know. I don't have any inside information on that. All I know is that there's nothing happening now. But you never know. That phone may ring, and it's like <laughs> we need you, buddy. <laughs> we we need some more meth here. So <laughs> that's great. Let's talk a little bit about what you're working on now. First off, let's just cover because I know you're involved in it. Um, the strike, the WJ strike. Do you have any comments or thoughts on it? And it's been rough. I know for a lot of writers, you know, a lot of writers, and I'm in the union as well. Um, and I've done a lot of, you know, I did some picketing out here and I shut down some HBO shows for the union. What do you, can you explain to people a little bit about the strike who don't understand and what's at stake? Because a lot of people are like, I just don't get my show and why? <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a big question. I mean, a lot of it has to do with the way um, seasons are structured now that there are not as many episodes in a season and up and coming writers are finding it very difficult to make a living that you can't do 10 episodes as a starting writer and then have to scramble and find another job and probably not to get another job because getting a, getting the job in the first place is hard enough. Um, but then having to go from one to another to just make ends meet for the year is near impossible. So uh, we're talking about uh, paying starting writers enough um, getting enough people in a writer's room to do the show and um, so that there's enough work to go around, so there's enough staff. Um, and also, you know, just fair compensation for streaming. You know, they keep telling us that uh, there's no way of knowing how many people are watching your show, but then they'll announce, oh, this many people right. watched whatever show just appeared on Netflix. So they're not showing us the books or showing us the number, the, you know, the numbers, um, and, you know, that's just part of why the strike is happening. Um, but you, I think what a lot of people don't understand, they have this impression that it's millionaire writers fighting millionaire, you know, millionaire oh, producers. It, it's not that it really <laughs> isn't. <laughs> yeah, no, I was, I was doing as an executive producer working, doing fine, but it's not a, really about me so much as about, the new generation of writers. Yeah. They're just not a, they just can't survive on what's being paid to them. So that's, yeah. and, and what, if you look at, if you, you can find online, the number we're asking for from each studio is like a, you know, point zero one. Well, it's such a small fraction of their earnings that they're standing, they're, they're willing to let everything shut down for such a small percentage of their profits. It's it's mind boggling what is happening right now, why they are letting it go on so long. And it's just like these some of these it was like, what is, you know, what do you need to do to be the head of one of these studios? It's like if your qualification is you can be a troll under a bridge making people's life miserable. Yeah, let's <laughs> get, here's your job, guys. run this network. <laughs> fucking ridiculous it's just it's uh i'm getting i'm getting angry now <laughs> yeah, yeah you're turning it's red just, tom <laughs> uh no it's uh yeah I, it's just it's my it's I, it's unfathomable that it's gone on as long as it has and there's we're it's in their court now to come up back with a counter proposal and why they haven't yet i don't know well i mean i do know actually it's because i don't want to start people out <laughs> But but it's 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 different than the previous strike, um, which were they were more they they were on the same page the the group yeah. who were under covered under the AMPTP. Now you have there's a different model. Different services have different models, and I don't Netflix, think they can agree. Yeah, and the studios are on totally different pages. Amazon, yeah. NBC, and and ABC, and Disney they they want different things, so they amongst themselves can't agree on what to do and come back to us with. So there's this weird, like, I don't know what to do. You know, they're, they're just, 
I don't think, you know, writers and actors are united about what we want. And they're like, we, we, what do we offer? What can we give up? Yeah. Let's talk about something happier. Well, a question, <laughs> a question uh, coming in. Did you anticipate Breaking Bad to have the influence it had on the film industry or the culture here in Albuquerque in New Mexico um, beforehand as a whole, all together? No. Did you get that talk? Yeah, I, I don't think there's any way. Uh, I, being in the moment when we were writing the show of having any, because originally people weren't even watching the show. There was very little. And it was, right. I hate to say something nice about Netflix, but I have to, is thanks to uh, the show, <laughs> you know, Breaking Bad appearing on Netflix that people got to catch up with the show and uh, sort of get into it. So the, but by the time we were writing season five, there was a sort of swell of interest of people who were watching it and telling other people, oh, you got to watch this. So that, uh, you know, at the time it was less like, we're, are we, you know, season four, I didn't even think by the end of season, season four, we knew we were going to be picked up. You know, when, when uh, Walter White kills Gus Fring or Hector Salamanca kills Gus Fring, that could have been the ending right there. It would have been unsatisfying that, that, that in our minds, we were like, we didn't know we were coming back. And eventually AMC said, yeah, you guys are back and you're going to, we're going to do one, you know, it was decided by Vince is like, we'll do one more. We can finish this out in one season, tell the Walter White story. Um, so no, we didn't, we didn't really know what the impact on, on filmmaking television or Albuquerque. It was just like, we loved, 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 loved working in Albuquerque on both shows. Uh, it was such a blast. Um, we got two minutes, Tom, and I really, this is a very important question. I, I really wanted to ask you before we wrap up. Tell us a little bit about, I know the strike is interrupting some of what you're doing, but I wanted you to talk about Gen V and some of the things you're doing. You were working on the boys spinoff before the strike. Is that still on for you? Because I'm dying to see your new stuff. So tell us what your new stuff is and what you're doing. Besides the weed snacks film you're going to make for us. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Go ahead. <laughs> There is a spinoff of the boys called Gen V. Uh, before I joined the staff for season two, they already shot season one. Season one is actually supposed to come out this month. I think later this month or actually a week or pretty soon. Gen V will be on uh, Amazon. Uh, I was I had nothing to do with season one, um, but we were just uh, with Michelle Fazekas, who I worked with on Reaper, uh, asked me to join the staff and I wanted to work with her again. So I had joined... So we were only worked for about two months on uh, season two before the, the strike happened. So um, you're not going to get to see any new work from me, but you will get to see uh, work from Eric Kripke and uh, Michelle Fazekas and Tyra Butters in this uh, new show called Gen V, which Very works cool. in the boys' timeline. I'm a big fan of the boys. So I, was, I was so excited to see you. We're going to... When the strike ends, are we going to see you? Are you still on board with the show? I hope so. I was uh, slated to to write and direct an episode in the new season, but you know, I do, I really don't know what will what's going to happen. I mean, hopefully, knock on wood, that yeah, that Amazon says yeah, that continue continue the show or whatever. But you know, I I really have no idea what's going to happen with anything anywhere. They could cancel right. deals. They could they could say Tom Schnauz, you're too expensive to work on the show. Will kick you. Out. You what? I you know who, who knows what it could be. I have zero idea. So it'd be great to go back and work on it, but I don't know uh, even if they're going to pick up a season two now. Final quick question because we have less than a minute. Since you've been in New Mexico and now, Albuquerque, I'm going to put you on the spot. Red, green, or Christmas? <laughs> I'm a. Weird, I can't do anything hot. Scott, you made a dinner. <laughs> for me. You were like, you ever remember that test dinner you made that you were going to cook for your parents? And I yes. came over to the place, your apartment, and you cooked this dinner. It was so hot, it made my nose bleed. Yeah, that's because <laughs> you're a white boy, Tom. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so I, you know, I'm a, I'm a mild, mild sauce. <laughs> Tom, that was great. Thank you so much uh, yeah. for your time and, and going through so much <laughs> about your show and your creative process. It's been an absolute pleasure. Um, one thing I didn't get to ask you about, and I wanted to so bad, was to ask you about Mickey Dolitz and the Monkees. And and <laughs> are you still hanging out with Mickey these days? I haven't seen him in a while, but I'm actually going to go see his show. He's playing. He's doing 
uh, the Monkey's album headquarters in its entirety. Um, I can't remember where he's playing it, but if in a week or two, uh, I'm going to go see that show. Oh, that's great. Well, Tom, thank you for being our guest here at We Snacks. Like I said, we'd love to have you back again anytime. You you have an open invitation, and if you're ever in Albuquerque, let us know. We're going to take you uh, to Sadie's or someplace cool so we can, you know, give you a big colon blow, <laughs> make your nose bleed again, something fun. <laughs> but you look great, and you know, it's been wonderful having you. You know, um, one of the best writers, in my opinion, the best writer in Hollywood. Here uh, for an exclusive interview, are, it's been great. You are a sweetheart, man. I, well, it's so good seeing you. I miss you. I'd love to come to Albuquerque again very soon. <laughs> Very cool, Tom. Well, take care and best of luck with all with with all your endeavors. And hopefully, this the bullshit ends soon, and we're all back to working and entertaining people and doing creative stuff. It would be great. It would be great. <laughs> all right, Tom. You take care, and I'll talk to you soon, my friend. All right, thank you, Scott. All right, take care.